ข้าสู่ IAEA Expert Mission Training Optimization in Radiological Practice นะคะอาทิตย์ที่อาทิตย์ที่11ของมิชชั่นนี้แล้วนะคะซึ่งอาทิตย์นี้เนี่ยเราจะมาพูดถึงในเรื่องของ Dose Metric แล้วก็ Uh, setting dose alert level ของ m a m o g r a m นะคะโดยเราก็ยังได้รับความอนุเคราะห์จากผู้เชี่ยวชาญของ IAEA นะคะด็อกเตอร์แซมมัวแบรดดี้จาก Cincinnati Children's Hospital ที่จะมาเล่าให้เราฟังถึงในเรื่องของ dose alert level แล้วก็ dose metric ของ uh, ของ m a m o g r a m นะคะ Good evening Sam nice to meet you again and welcome back to the expert mission we are almost done this week is week 11 of 12 that We are going to talk about. We're gonna follow from last week. So last week we talking about the mammogram uh, uh, optimization and also uh, uh, the metric. And this week we are going we are going to focus more on the dose metric and also how to set up the dose alert level. So it's your time. Mm-hmm. Hello. Now you, can, hello. <laughs> now you can hear me. I can hear you now. Now you can talk. Yep. I, I can just talk with my hands the whole time. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. I'm glad to be back. Yeah, it's it's amazing. It's been 11 weeks. We've been going mm-hmm. strong. Not almost three months. Yeah. <laughs> so 11 weeks, and we're on session 19. So this has been this has been quite the ordeal, and I'm very, very glad for every one of you that have stuck with us this whole time. We've talked about all of the different modalities. Today is the last, the second discussion on mam- mam- mammography, which is the last. The last modality that we're going to talk about. So obviously, um, as we discussed a while ago, next week will be just a wrap-up session where we'll kind of summarize a lot of the points that we talked about. So, as Tanya mentioned, last week we talked about image quality optimization in mammography. So today we're going to focus on dose. The first lecture, the first session, will be on the dose metric. So, which, how do we calculate dose for the in mammography, and then The next session, in a, a little bit, we'll talk about how do we optimize it. So it's actually very simple in mammography. There is one dose metric. There is one way to calculate dose that we typically use for diagnostic reference levels. It's the way we've been doing this for many years, for several decades now, and that is the mean glandular dose. Most publications still call it MGD or mean glandular dose. But the IAEA and almost all international societies now list it as D sub G, which is glandular dose. So throughout this talk, I am going to refer to mean glandular dose as D sub G, just to be in line with the IAEA. So to calculate mean glandular dose, we need to know air kerma. And that's air kerma at the surface, the entrance surface of the breast. So as the mammography unit is usually going to be cranial collar or medial lateral oblique, it's going to, we're talking about the exposure dose at the top point or superior aspect of the breast. In a more recent time, in the last couple of years, there has been a new dose metric proposed in mammography. It's called the average absorbed breast dose or 2ABD. And we'll talk about why this is now being op- offered. Uh, when we look at dose reference levels, there are no dose reference levels out there right now for 2ABD. So everything that you guys are doing in Thailand for your DRLs, we're still talking mean glandular dose. But we're going to talk about 2ABD because 2ABD is actually probably at some point going to replace MGD, or excuse me, uh, mean glandular dose. It's just a, it's a different type of or a different way to do the same thing. There we go. Now we should just talk briefly how in literature you'll also see people refer to effective dose for breast imaging. Obviously, we've said this many a times, but we do not use effective dose to calculate DRLs or publish DRLs. But I have one slide. I'll talk a little bit about how we calculate effective dose. Or how we use effective dose in mammography. So mean glandular dose, because it's still the main metric for DRLs, we're going to focus probably the majority of our talk today on this on this metric. This metric, ha- the the like I said, this metric has been around for uh, wow, it's going on a little over 20 years. No, a little over 30 years now. The very first publication that came out was in 1990 by Dance and his colleagues, and this, a very first publication, 
obviously some 30 years ago was based on film mammography. So it only looked at the common target of moly or molybdenum and rhodium and the common filters, which was molybdenum also and rhodium. So the common combinations of the target and filter were moly moly, moly rho or rho rho. So those three major or unique combinations of target and filter were used back in film days. And so when you look at this publication, it only refers to those old, that old way of doing imaging. Although there's still one vendor today that uses that, those same combination of target and filters. Dance, however, came out uh, about 10 years ago with a, a updated publication where he included more, a, a new way to, not a new way, but a, he uh, added new lookup tables for his original met empirical method of calculating glandular dose. And now he includes all the, all the brand new targets such as tungsten and their new filters such as rhodium, tungsten rhodium or tungsten silver. So there, the second most common method is the Wu method. And this came out about four years after the very first dance method. And once again, as you can assume, back in 1990s, it was all film-based. So it was the Molly Molly, Molly Row, Row Row. And Boone, John Boone came out about five years after Wu, and he published his version, which built off of Wu, but because Wu only did Molly Molly, Molly Row and Row Row, Boone, he added tungsten, rhodium, and tungsten silver to that off option. So when we talk about today's way to calculate mean glandular dose, there's really only technically two ways to do it. There's the dance method and there's the Boone method. But the Boone method is based off of the Wu method. So I, I know it sounds complicated, but it's all there. So what, what do we need to know to calculate this methodology? So the mean glandular dose, you need to know the breast thickness, the amount of glandularity in the breast. So we oftentimes talk about the standard model being 50% glandular tissue, 50% adipose or fat tissue. Obviously, we're going to talk a little bit. We're going to talk about how in a little bit later in this, this lecture that that 50-50 standard breast dose or standard for breast uh, um, uh, glandularity is kind of mythical. It really doesn't exist. So obviously we can, we need to figure out a way to calculate different types of glandular. So for women that have less glandular tissue versus women that have more glandular tissue, but you need to know breast thickness, glandularity, you need to know what the x-ray spectrum is of the system. So you need to know what the target and filter is, and you need to know what the beam quality is or the half value layer. If you know these three, these four things, you can calculate the mean glandular dose. And you could do this by hand, but it's very difficult. So what ended up happening is you had the dance, the woo, and the boon method that they published based on a bunch of Monte Carlo calculations. They published a bunch of tables. And so if you know what your x-ray spectrum is, so you know what your target and filter is, and you know what your half value layer is, and the breast thickness and assumed glandularity, you can look up a correction value and you can make the calculations. So when it's all said and done with, it's very important to understand that we keep saying mean glandular dose, but it's actually a dose estimate. We don't really know what the dose is to the breast being imaged. It's a model. The calculation is based on a breast model. It's not actually patient specific dose, which should be no surprise because there's no patient specific dose in CT. There's no patient specific dose in fluoro. There's no patient specific dose in x-ray. So you would assume that there would be no patient specific dose in mammography. So we always, always talk about patient dose, but we actually don't know the specific dose. We can get real good estimates and there's no reason why those estimates shouldn't be applicable to patient populations. But when Jane walks in and you know someone gets their, their mammogram, we don't actually specifically know what the dose is to that breast. So let's look at the two major methods, the dance method and the Wu Boon method. The dance method is probably the most common. You'll see this in publications whenever you read about mammography. 
And the way that he, he developed this is you take the air kerma at the, as measured at the entrance surface or the upper part of the breast tissue, and you need to correct for the amount of glandularity. This G factor assumes a 50% glandular, 50% fat mod, breast model. But we know that every breast that gets imaged is not exactly 50-50. And so we have to take into account for that particular breast being imaged in that scenario, in that moment, we need to then correct for however much glandularity is in that breast in that image. And that's what C is. C is an estimation of the glandularity in the image uh, of the imaged breast. And then S is that spectra correction. Remember the half value layer, which is dependent on the target filter combination. Excuse me. So then Boone, as we've already discussed, he built, he basically modernized Wu's calculation to move beyond just molly, 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 row and row, row, which are the only scanner out there on the market now that you can buy modern. So maybe you have older scanners that still do this, but more modern scanners. The only modern one out there that could use the Wu method is um, GE. And so theirs is slightly different. Basically, you still need to know the air kerma at the upper entrance surface of the breast, but then there's just a single value. Instead of the CGS co correction coefficients, now it's just this D sub GN. And that value is, once again, a value you can look up in a lookup table. So Boone provided all of these empirical equations. So you could actually use these equations if you wanted to create your own calculation model, your own, your own software. You have these equations that you could build into it. The equations are based off of breast thickness and the machine half value layer or the beam quality. And there are equations based off of assumptions, such as these equations you see here are made for a 50% glandular, 50% fat breast model. And it's very important to recognize, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, that all of these standard breast models assume that there's the skin layer, that there's a five millimeter layer of fat before you get to the glandular tissue underneath. Every breast model assumes this skin, fat, glandular type model. And I know you guys have seen enough mammograms for those of you that look at them to know this breast model is not actually a traditional or typical breast that you would see. Now, I'm not saying there isn't a breast out there that has a five millimeter fat layer, but they all come in different shape sizes and yeah, mix glandular fat mix. But that said, once again, this is just a this is a dose calculation for a standard model. And so you can go in, you can look at all these tables depending on your combination of target filter and whatever assumption of glandularity. So this table, I just simply took a screenshot of is for 100% glandularity for the tungsten rhodium target filter combination. And then you would just know what KV you used. You would know the half value layer for that system. And then depending on how thick the breast is, you'd pick a number that say this 96 value, and that's the value you would multiply to the air kerma to get your glandular, mean glandular dose. <clears throat> a publication that came out 2017, so only, only three to four years ago. This isn't an old one. And what Suleiman and his colleagues did is they looked at the reported mean glandular dose, the value that the machine tells you so it's written down somewhere on the screen or part of the metadata. It's the machine reported mean glandular dose compared to the value that these scientists actually calculated using the dance method, the Wu method, or the Boone method. So the manual calculations are on the y-axis, the machine reported values are on the x-axis. Here you can see on the left, you have GE. On the right, you have Sectra, which is now Phillips. And then in the middle is Fuji and Hologic. And you, this, the dashed lines going here on the 45 degree and every one of these plots is quote unquote truth. If the machine reported a number that was exactly the same as what was calculated by hand, 
then it would be a one-to-one -one correlation or perfectly accurate, 100% accurate. So anytime the trend lines deviate from this dashed line, that tells you how much the system values are different than truth. So you can see here, there's a couple of things going on. GE uses the Wu method because you know Wu is only good for Molly, 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 row, or row, row. And you can see for two different types of GE scanners, one is very accurate and one is overestimate. Excuse, um, yeah, the system overestimates. To forgive me, system underestimates. If the line is above the dashed line, it underestimates. So the machine says it's say it says it's four milligray. The reality is it's actually six milligray. So if it's above the line, it underestimates. And then you come over here, you can see, for example, the Boone method being used down here in Hologic is actually fairly accurate, but it's not very precise. You can see how there's a lot of variation, a lot of spread in the data. Whereas basically all the other plots you see here are very tight to the dashed line. And then you see here the sector of the Phillips, they're pretty accurate. Although the, this Phillips system has kind of this weird little deviation up here for whatever reason. So what you see here, just take a big step back and look at this. Every machine reports slightly differently the dose. Every machine has a different accuracy and every machine has a different precision. So that's just a big picture here. When you look at all of this together, Solomon reported that there is a range, a difference in reported doses anywhere from 24, 0.24 milligrays underrepresented or underreported to 0.36 milligrays overrepresented or overreported, which is about an 18% spread. And here's just some actual numbers. These are the mean or the average mean glandular dose values. And it's broken down by the system output and then the manual calculation using Woo dance, woo, or boon technique. And I'm going to talk about that in a moment. The question that they ask is why? Why a plus or minus 18%? Why such variation from vendor to vendor to vendor? Now, each vendor has adopted their way of calculating things. So Phillips or Sector uses the dance method. GE uses the Wu method, which is no surprise. Hologic, Boone, Fuji uses dance. But the way that you calculate and make assumptions based on the glandularity of the breast being imaged at that moment is unknown or as listed as proprietary. So therefore the vendor is not telling the scientists or telling anyone how they make those assumptions. So a lot of the variability in how we calculate mean glandular dose is based on this idea of how we estimate glandularity in the image and how we correct for that for the dose calculation. So let's just look at the data a little bit closer. So a couple of things you would assume. You would assume that if the system, for example, Phillips, which uses the dance method, you would assume that their output value would be fairly similar to a manual calculation using the dance method, which in this case it is in these two Phillips units or sector units. And if you calculate them using a Boone method, in this case, the Boone method is actually pretty different. In this case, the Boon method was actually pretty accurate. And then GE, GE used the Wu method. Interestingly enough, the GE output value 1.42 does not match the Wu method. It actually matches very closely with the dance method. So it's kind of a little strange and the Boon method's much different. Um, and then you would expect the ones like we've said here, Hologic, for example, uses the Boon method. So you'd expect their output of 1.73 to be identical or nearly identical, but they're not. And Fuji uses dance. You would expect these to be identical, but they're not. In fact, in this case, the Fuji matches very closely with the Boone method. So there's just a lot of variability built into all of this. You just have to understand that when you get the data, especially when you're doing the dose, the, excuse me, the diagnostic reference levels, when you collect all this data, that there is actually gonna be a spread in accuracy there's gonna be a spread in accuracy if you actually physically calculated it. If, if hospital A sends calculated data in, well, there's gonna be a measured spread in data, measurement error. And then there's just intrinsic error based on the way that the mean glandular dose is calculated. 
Um, so how does this compare to other modalities? You might be thinking this is not good, right? 18% spread. Well, in fluoro, remember, the air kerma measured at the international reference point, the IRP, that is actually only required to be within 35%. So or not quite double, but you know, it, it, the values that you measure on a fluoro system can be significantly different than what you actually physically measure using an ion chamber. CTDI, vol, or the volume CTDI and CT can be upwards of difference of 20%. So breast dose, mammography doses are actually not too far off. In fact, they're actually doing pretty good when you put it in comparison of the other, ven the other machines out there when we're calculating their and collecting their values, their dose metrics, CTDI vol and air kerm at the IRP when we do D DRLs. How do we use these values? Well, you have to understand because there is some inherent variation when you compare one machine to the next machine to the next machine, you have to understand that obviously machine to machine comparison should be pretty accurate. So we can use these as dose audits and then we can use them to establish diagnostic reference levels, of course, which is what we're working on. And that, so we'll talk about diagnostic reference level at the end of my second talk but that just put that in the back of your mind. It's, it's probably helpful to collect all that data and you'll have your national diagnostic reference level, but it would also be helpful statistics wise if you have enough statistics to break it down by vendor type. And we'll talk a little bit about other ways to break it down, but there is a little bit of variation from machine to machine to machine. And so if one, ven if one hospital uses all Sectra but the data for the diagnostic reference levels was collected primarily for like a GE or a Hologic, then those numbers are going to be obviously different. But when you say a diagnostic reference level is say of two milligray, but this sector is a little higher, their value actually might be not that bad. It's just reporting differences. So, but we'll talk about that in, a, in the next talk. So we've been talking about here, full field digital mammography or breast to view, you know, CC, MLO, craniocaudal, medial lateral oblique when we're doing full image standard dose. The other way we do mammography is tomosynthesis where we do the sweep over a limited angle over the breast for either a craniocaudal or a medial lateral oblique. So how do we do organ or not organ dose, but mean glandular dose for this. In the dance method, it's the exact same thing with one more term tacked onto the end. T, capital T, is called the TOMO factor. And the TOMO factor takes into account the, tomo, the individual TOMO projections and weighting factors for each projection. Obviously, certain projections are going to incorporate only a certain type, a certain amount or dense or thickness of the breast, whereas others will have different. So we have to take into account the sweep effect. So let's look at the TOMO factor. One of the beautiful things about the TOMO factor is it is not dependent on glandularity. And it is, it is dependent, of course, as you would expect, the half value layer. So it is vendor specific. So when we have lookup tables, we will need to have different lookup tables for each vendor and for every target filter combination out there based on KV. You can see here by this curve, it's also dependent on tomo angle. So some systems may only do 15 degree sweeps. Some may do a full 30 degree sweep. And you can see how this factor, how it changes as a function of angle. So the tomo as it sweeps over may change this theta may be a short smaller for some and larger for others. And then of course, we need to know what the breast size is. The breast thickness is gonna change as a function of angle as you sweep over it. All of this is taken into account. They do, they've done a lot of simulations and publication based on those simulations. And so now based on breast thickness and the type of machine you're using, you can go look up these T factors. So you still need to know the air kerma and the G, the C, and the S. But now you can add to that just one more lookup table that you can find 
and tack that on to calculate mean glandular dose for a tomographic sweep. All right, I mentioned at the very beginning, mean glandular dose is the primary dose metric for mammography. We've been using that now for 30 plus years. But in the recent last probably five or so years, there's been a lot of talk about this 2ABD metric. So let's talk about what it is and how it's slightly different than the other mean glandular dose calculations we've been talking about. So here's the equation. It might look ugly, but it's actually fairly simple. Really what all we're doing here is we're integrating or we're summing over the thickness of the breast based on the entrance air kerma coming into the breast and the attenuation factor or the amount the breast attenuates the radiation. And then we normalize or divide that by D or it, the depth or excuse me, not the depth, the, the thickness of the breast. And the nice part about this attenuation coefficient right here, this attenuation portion of the calculation is that the attenuation coefficients depend on KV, MAS, so the MA times time or MA times S, and the target filter combination. All of these values, those three values right here, are values you can look up in the DICOM metadata. So you take a picture, a MLO or a CCC, a CC image, and that image will come across to PAX and in the metadata, in the header, you will find the KV, the MAS, the filter combinations. And from that, you can look up the mu sub n, en. And then of course we know breast thickness based on the compression. So what I'm trying to say here is when you look at this equation, here I did the math right here, you just integrate over. All you need to know is the air kerma you need to know what the attenuation coefficient is based on KV mass and the target filter and the breast thickness. All of these values are readily available in the header in the DICOM metadata, except for the air kerma. But based on the values given in the metadata, we can calculate air kerma at the entrance point because we know what the source image distance is we know how thick the breast is, so we know where we're measuring this in space, and we know what the output is based on KV and MA. So we can actually calculate the air kerma as it enters the breast. And when you look at across all vendors for all different thicknesses, so every different place along the imaging chain, the measured air kerma was almost nearly identical as the calculated. So that means everything we need to calculate the 2ABD can be found in the DICOM metadata. And that, that is why 2ABD is becoming a very powerful dose metric. And why I think at some point in the near future, 2ABD is going to replace the mean, the, the mean uh, glandular dose calculation. 2ABD can be calculated based on DICOM data. D sub G, mean glandular dose, cannot. We still need to make a bunch of assumptions and we still need all those lookup tables to calculate mean glandular dose. So it's not that efficient. So if we have a lady come in to get her mammogram, she gets the image. The image could then from the metadata, from the DICOM data, calculate the dose, the average dose of the breast. On the, if you want to do the mean glandular dose calculation, you have to go look up a bunch of, you have to go and look, use the values from the machine and look up a bunch of correction values, the G, C, S, and if it's, it's a digital breast tomosynthesis, you need to look up the T. So it's not very efficient doing that way. Um, but one of the beautiful things about 2ABD, if you look back at this equation, there is no correction for mean glandular dose. And remember in the, D sub G, the mean glandular, the, the assumption or the prediction of glandularity was probably the thing that caused so much variation. So therefore, not needing to know how much glandularity there is in the dough in the breast, we can actually get a little bit more precise uh, calculation for the average organ dose to the breast or the average dose to the breast. 
All right, when you look at the calculation, so the measurement uncertainty, mean this 2ABD is less than 0.1, so it's less than 10%, which is, it's on par, right? I, we mentioned that D sub G was 18%, 18% so it's a little bit better. It, at least it's not worse, so that's good. All right, now let's talk a little bit about effective dose. I really, frankly, only have one slide on this, and that's because you know we can't use effective dose for DRLs. But oftentimes you see this used quite a bit in publications. And the reason for that is, at least as people think about this, when you look at the, the four most sensitive organs and tissues in the body, breast is one of them. And it's got a mean tissue weighting factor of 12% or 0.12. And so because breast tends to be a little bit more sensitive, breast tissue is more sensitive to radiation. And what I mean by sensitive, that means there is a correlated risk to cancer at higher doses, of course, then they always they almost always report effective doses for breasts. But you need to understand when we calculate effective dose, effective dose is the average of both breast dose values. So you would get the average D sub G for breast, left breast and right breast, and then you would multiply that average by 0.12. Now, we don't always image both breasts, maybe on a diagnostic performance. If you go in for your screening mammography, there's something suspicious on the right breast, the lady comes back, the woman is only imaged on the right side. Obviously, you can't average two because there's a zero value here. So when you calculate effective dose for one breast, you have to take the value D sub G multiplied by 0.12 and divide it by two. All right, so everything we've been talking about is based on the standard breast dose model. So let's talk a little bit about that breast dose model. First thing is first, we assume that the standard breast dose model has a compressed thickness of 4.2 centimeters. And so we use a phantom to mimic that thickness. And then we assume that the breast is made up of equal parts fat, 50% fat and 50% glandularity. I call it the mythical 50-50 breast. We're gonna talk about how many women out there have 50% glandularity and how many of them have 50% adipose. And then I'll leave it to you to make the assumption or to, to answer the question, is the 50-50 breast dose model a accurate model to be used for women. So the phantom itself that you can go buy or you can make if you're really interested in, it needs to be made of either acrylic or BR12. BR12 is a soft tissue uh, a mimicking phantom. It's plastic, it's, it's, it's a, but it, it tends to be a little less dense than acrylic. You typically want to get these in slabs of two centimeters or, um, yeah, two centimeters, so you can build up different thicknesses. Obviously, you'd want to be able to get 4.2 centimeters, but there are different breast thicknesses, and so we'd want to be able to mimic all different breast thicknesses. Here in the US, we typically use what's called the ACR breast phantom. I imagine you guys probably use this too because the IAEA has adopted the use of this of this breast thick breast phantom also. This breast phantom itself has image quality targets embedded in it. And so we typically image the phantom to measure or get an estimate of the overall image quality in the system. But we use the phantom in this situation to also measure the dose to the breast. So the phantom itself mimics a four to six centimeter thick compressed breast. And we place the phantom on the detector over top of the AEC sensor, obviously we keep the, put the compression pedal in the field of view. And then we take the ion chamber here, you can see right here, this circular object. We take this ion chamber and we place it so it is in the same plane. So it's up here parallel with the surface of this phantom. The phantom itself, because it's over the AEC, will cause the system to It'll, it'll, it'll cause the system to use a certain amount of exposure 
commensurate with a four to six centimeter thick breast. And the ion chamber, of course, will then measure that dose with respect to however much MAS is being used to image this phantom. We place this chamber specifically about four centimeters from the chest wall or this edge of the, of the detector. And then, like I said, we keep it so it's, a, it's level with the top of the, the, the imaging phantom. All right, we obviously, oh, I already talked about the compression paddle. Here we go. We obviously need to use clinical protocols. So you would go in based on your four to six centimeter uh, patient protocol, you would set the KV and you would let the AEC then run the MAS. The system would pick the target and filter based on the KV you've established in the protocol. And then you'll make multiple measurements, usually four or so, and then you average them together and that will be your exposure for this breast phantom or X your exposure value x. So now we need to make a we need to calculate or look up a correction value f to scale the exposure value because it's obviously being measured here in air and we need to make that an actual estimate for mean glandular dose. So, how do we do that? We these conversion factors are dependent on the half value layer, the beam spectrum or quality, which is de dependent on kv target and filter combinations, and our assumption of breast composition. Is it gonna be 50-50? Is it gonna be 25% glandularity, 75% fat, et cetera? And then obviously the breast thickness. Of course, the breast thickness using this phantom is, is standard, you know, four to six centimeters. Here's an example. I just simply just, we just do a simple math in a simple example to show you how to do the calculation. If you have a protocol that uses a KV of 26 and your MAS, your AEC would drive the system to produce 100 MAS, you would need to know what the half value layer of is for your 26 KV exposure. And it's, if it's 0.33, as in this example, and you know that 26 KV here is the correction value F, it's 168 millirads per R, which is equivalent to 1.68 milligrays per R or Rankins. We've made our measurement using the ion chamber. So we know that it produced 1.02 Rankins. So we multiply these two together. Our estimate for the mean glandular dose is 1.71. So D sub G is 1.71. So we measure using our ion chamber and then based on our half value layer in KV, we look up a correction value. So it's pretty straightforward. Just a word, there are there is a new, new wish, I should say, ACR Phantom. It's actually been out for, I think it's, it's getting close to 10 years now. It's been available. So I don't know which Phantom you typically use. Most people still use that. A lot of people still use that small one. But this new filter, this new Phantom is is actually a really nice phantom because it covers the full field of view. So when you do your image quality assessments, you don't have a teeny phantom inside a big white field. You can actually, because the phantom now covers the full field of view, the dynamic range of the system is better. And also because we're using digital imaging, digital detectors now, we needed a phantom that had smaller masses and less contrast to, uh, in their uh, targets so that we could actually truly see how good the system is. The older square, smaller phantom was developed back in the day when we did all, the, all mammography was film. So the big problem with this phantom, it's still the same. It's still 4.6 centimeter, it mimics a four to six centimeter thick breast, it, but it covers the full field of view. So you can't place your ion chamber next to your, your phantom to make your measurements. So how do we do this? Well, you take the phantom, you place it in there, you situate it. Once again, the wax insert is over the AEC. You got the compression paddle in the field of view and you acquire an image and you use your clinical protocol, whatever it is. So you know what KV it is. You'll know what the half value layer is. You write down the technique factor. This phantom exposure gave me, let's say 26 KV and 100 MAS. 
So once you've written that down, you take that phantom out. A good practice is to place like a, a sheet of copper or some kind of, I don't know, like lead or something just to cover and protect the detector. And then you place your chamber, your ion chamber or your digital, digital probe, once again, in the system over the, you know, centered over where the AEC chamber is. You got the compression paddle, of course, in the field of view, but you can't use the AEC because you got a big copper plate here. So what you do now is you set it to manual mode and you use the technique factor that you had just acquired based on this phantom up here. So that in my example, the 26 kV 100 MAS. Now your ion chamber, your digital probe will measure the exposure or the output based on that out, that, that technique factor that, was, that we set established based on the phantom thickness. Same process, you still have all these lookup tables to find your F value based on KV, half value layer. And once again, you can pick it for all breast thicknesses. You can do your four or 4.2 centimeter, five, six, seven, eight centimeter thick. Here you can see this is simply a screenshot of one of the lookup tables. This was for 100% glandularity. You could get the same would be true. You would see a similar looking table if it was 50-50 or if it was 25-75 or 75-25, whatever that combination of breast glandularity versus breast fat. Now, once you have three or four of these lookup tables, you can actually put them in Excel, in an Excel spreadsheet, or if you like to use you know, Python or MATLAB or R, however you like to do your software programming, you can create it so that you can interpolate between all of these values. So now you could figure out what a 4.3, 4.5 or a 5.7 thick breast is for any percent glandularity for any KV combination. And you'll be able to do mean glandular dose for any protocol you could ever possibly think of because there's obviously a huge range of breasts out there, breast composition, breast thickness. All right, and then obviously there's all kinds of different targets and filters depending on the machines you have in your hospital. So let's talk a little bit about the expected breast dose variation. So we've been talking quite about, about this variability built into the fact that as humans, we all come in different shapes, and <laughs> different sizes. So we know there are some fundamental truths. First, smaller breasts tend to be more glandular. So in this publication here, you look at the mean breast thickness as it trends smaller. So here's a two centimeter breast, three centimeter, and this is compressed, of course. You can see the glandularity tended to be in this patient population higher. Whereas a thicker breast, usually out towards eight centimeters, was much less glandularity by volume. And we just know as, as the breast tends to get bigger, it tends to be bigger based on the fat volume and glandularity will, will tend to be consistent. Um, we know for an equal thick breast, if that same thickness of breast, let's say 4.2 versus 4.2 centimeters, if one of those has a higher level of glandularity, say 30, 40, 50, 60%, we know the system will need to use more MA or MAS to penetrate the breast to create the image. And that is because glandular tissue is more attenuating than fat. That's why it looks white on the image compared to the fat, which is darker black or gray. And then we know, of course, the more we compress the breast, the thinner it gets, the less radiation we need to use to penetrate it, less photons. And that's unfortunately why we put all these women through the horrible experience of compressing their breast. But you see here, on these plots, that the thinner they go, the lower the dose is. And the thinner they go, the less KV we need to use, which is a good thing for image quality. Because as KV goes down, contrast goes up. So when we look at this variation across the general spectrum of compressed breast thicknesses, we see that there is basically a plus or minus two, a factor of two dose. So it, it varies quite a bit in, uh, in radiation dose across this small, what you would probably consider a small spectrum of say two to eight centimeters. 
but that within that same spectrum, you'll see the dose change by a factor of two, can be up to a factor of two. Now that ACR phantom that we use, that is pretty standard, uh, internationally, the IAEA here in the US, of course, uh, in Europe, they have theirs too. But whoops, that 4.2 centimeter breast, if you look at 4.2, when you compare that to the patient population out there, that actually 4.2 centimeter breast actually only represents about a 40% glandularity. So the phantom itself mimics 50. But what we're saying here is the patient population for a 4.2 centimeter breast is actually on average only 40% glandularity. So you see an example here of where the, the standard breast model, it doesn't actually kind of match up with reality. So what is reality? Now, you have to forgive me, I looked, I'm sure there's a paper out there, I just couldn't find it. But there was a publication that looked at the breakdown of percent glandularity and this was done here in the US where they looked at about 3000 patients. They took all of their mammograms and they looked at the percent density of glandularity and thickness and a bunch of other things. So here, let's look at the plot on the left. You can see here as a function of age, younger women, they tended to be here, you have um, predominantly fatty, scattered fiber glandular, heterogeneously dense, and extremely dense. So the younger women tended to be heterogeneous to extremely dense when it comes to fiber glandular, uh, yeah, to, to glandularity. And then as you get older, um, you see that the right side of the shift is these dark purple yellow, they start to shrink and this blue and light kind of purple lilac color, I guess, starts to increase. So as older we get, it becomes less dense, more scattered fiber glandular, and it, it trends towards fatty. So we already know this. I mean, we know this by inspection. We've been looking at mammograms now for many decades. And then you look at the overall histogram of compressed breast thicknesses. The values here in black are for a CC, Caudal view, the average thickness here, so the peak, the mode in this case is five centimeters, and the average is somewhere pretty darn close to five centimeters. So it's not actually 4.2, <laughs> but it's actually closer to five centimeters. So this idea of a 50% fiber glandular, 50% fat, um, and then a question of, does the, the, should we consider or assume that there's a five millimeter subcutaneous fat layer underneath the skin? That, this whole model right here that I'm talking about, that was proposed back in 1979. And so does it actually exist? Well, I showed you the breakdown of the, I showed you the trending. So we know that glandularity changes with age. We also know that breast thickness is actually not on average 4.2, at least in the US, admittedly, I couldn't find any studies for Thailand, but what about glandularity? So in a separate study of 2,800, 2,831 women, this was US and Canada. So once again, more Western population. They also included, so there's 2,831 mammograms and they looked at, 191 CTs. So I don't know if Thailand has this, but there are dedicated CT scanners of the breast. And we have some of those here in the US. So it's not a CT of the body itself. It's actually a CT of the breast itself, specifically. All right, I'm sorry, I, I misspoke here. Total of 2831, 2,640 mammals, just shy of 200 CTs of the breast. So once again, they looked at what was the average glandularity. So if you just look at the histogram here, the mode is gonna be here right on 15, but the mean, when you look at it breaks down is actually just shy of 20%. It's actually 19.3%. Here you can see the first quartile 13.7 and the second quartile, excuse me, the third quartile, the 75th percentile is the 25.6. So 
the vast majority of the patients are right here, somewhere between 13 and 25% glandular. So where is the 50-50 breast? If you look over here, 50% glandularity is less than, in this total count, so it's a histogram, there were less than probably 50 patients out of 2,800 patients. So not very common to find a woman that has 50% glandularity. Now, in this study by Yaffe, they looked at the overall volume of glandularity. In one of their calculations, they looked at it that included the skin line and another one where it did not include the skin line. And that was based on the way they thresholded the images so that they could separate the fat versus glandularity. And as you know, looking at the image, skin is highly attenuating too. So the skin and the glandular material, you know, the ducts, the, the, you know, the structure, the ligaments and all that, the vessels, all of that, they all tend to attenuate similarly. So they all appear basically the same. So it was a little bit harder for them to separate, but they did do their best to separate. Um, there in this publication, they, uh, they actually measured a mean average compression thickness of almost six centimeters. So slightly larger, or I guess less compressed than the last study that we looked at. And so I, here's the averages. I just simply point out the fact that depending on how they calculated, if they calculated the mean glandular volume, when you consider skin, that's how it came up with the 19%. If you take the skin out of the calculation, so it's truly, truly just the glandular material inside the, the, vol, the breast, it, the average is actually only 14%. So uh, that 50-50 model, I guess the take home message here is that 50-50 model is really not that accurate. So when we're calculating dose to mean glandular dose of 50-50, 50% glandular, 50% fat, in most cases, you are way overestimating the actual dose to the patient on the scanner. Because statistically speaking, as we just showed, most of those doses are, uh, most of those breasts are not going to be 50% glandular. Now, we also know that that has a big variation with age. We already showed this, but the point I wanted to show in this Yaffe public, uh, plot is look at the air bars here. So the vertical here is the volume of breast uh, of the, of the uh, glandularity. And so you can see here, there is, you know, the younger you are, the more glandular these women tend to be. So there is a certain population in the younger era that could be your 50 50. But as you definitely trend older, especially as you're getting out towards 70 and 80, the, this is where that mean is shifted so low of 19% because, you know, the majority of women getting mammograms are over 40 and they tend to be, and that population that is starting to skew more fatty or more more fat per volume of the breast than the glandular tissue. All right, so just a quick summary of what we've been talking about. Singular dose metric that we use currently for diagnostic reference levels. My apologies, that's that's typed wrong. DRLs is the mean glandular dose or the D sub G. The D sub G we went through all the different ways to calculate that for full field digital mammography. And we, I showed the one way we calculated it for the tomosynthesis. And we talked about how the values reported. So the values you are collecting for your DRLs are gonna have an inherent error based on it, which machine it was, it was collected and which method those vendors used. So that error is roughly 18%. And then we talked about the standard breast dose model as we collect with phantoms. So when we calculate the mean glandular dose, we went through how we calculate that. And then we talked about the fact that this whole 50-50 thing doesn't exist. And so if your calculations are assuming 50% glandularity, you are in most cases overestimating the actual dose to the lady being imaged. All right, that's what I got for the first talk.
Thank you so much, Sam. So one thing that I got from your lectures, it seemed like that is a little bit complex for the for the dose on the mammogram because of the uh because of the vendor depends on the machine depends on the filter yep. and we it's it's so it's not like a user friendly when we're trying to collect the data for the mammogram which is kind of cause a lot of issue for us <laughs> yeah and, and this is true so you guys have already done a round of drls and we're talking about that in the next talk the reality is that's just what you have to deal with. It, I guess the point of all of this, I hope you take away with, is the fact that the numbers that you will now collect, now that you got all these different hospitals out there with their dose monitoring software, they're collecting that data from their mammogram systems. And it's gonna be a mixed bag. It's gonna be some GE, some Hologic, some you know, Philips, it's gonna be whatever you guys have. And those values are gonna be reported. And though there's gonna be an, excuse me, an inherent error of about plus or minus 18%. And then when you collect all of that data and you send it off to the central location, and then you have all of that data collected, now it's across all of your hospitals, all of the ways you use it. You just have to understand that when you calculate and you report your 75th percentile, your DRL, and you then send that back to all the hospitals, that there is just that inherent measurement error and that inherent error from the based on the calculation. So I guess my point is, is when you guys represent a value, which you guys calculated your DRL, basically two milligray, that value, you know, plus or minus 18% at a standard machine, if it is close to your DRL could be plus 18 or minus 18% of that value. And that may be not because the image quality is bad. It may not be because you're overdosing the patient. It may simply be because they used the woo calculation or the dance calculation or the boon calculation. So ultimately, that's just what we're dealt we are we're dealt we're dealing with. What we need to do is always do our best to try to get under the DRL. But we've said this all along. You look at the image quality you look at your doses, and then you have to put the two together and ask yourself, do I have room to drop my dose? Because is my image quality okay? Or am I looking at my images right now? And I kind of think I couldn't lower my dose anymore. And if you're okay with the image quality, but you don't really want to drop your doses, and you're right at or maybe just a little bit above the DRL, that 18% value should probably make you feel okay. Now, if here's the DRL and you're more than 18% above the DRL, then everything we've talked about, all of this variation, that has nothing to do with the fact that you're overexposing based on the national DRL. In that case, you should do your best to drop it down closer to the DRL. So are you trying to say that 18% is like a buffer zone? for the filter, for the vendor specific, and for the formula, which is like an acceptable area for the, for the overall picture when we have the national dose. And if the, each hospital want to go back and look on the, uh, like a, on that technique, specifically on the, on the vendor, they, they need to, how medical physicists and ask them to do like a, the real measurement and those things and also look at the lookup table. But for the overall picture, we use like an 18% plus and minus to be like a buffer zone. So that is, so yeah, there's kind of two answers I would give to that. Okay. What, the simple answer is if you have the DRL, you do your best to try to get your value closer to that DRL but mm -hmm. you have to look at your image quality. So that's the simple answer. If you don't have a medical physicist and you don't wanna think about it, you just look at, okay, if I'm all the way over here, maybe I reduce my dose a little, look at my image quality, it's okay. Reduce my dose a little, look at my image quality, that's okay. Reduce my dose a little and I'm starting to not like it. So maybe I back it up a little and I stop there. Mm -hmm. Now the question is, okay, 
what does that 18% mean? So yeah, now if you have physicists and you have the ability to go in and do these calculations, you can go in and you can actually look at each of the vendors. So let's say you have two or three at the hospital or whatever imaging site you have there in the region. And you can look at, you know, it's Sectra, it's, it, it's you know, or Philips, I should say, GE, it's Siemens, it's Hologic. You have all of these vendors and you can go in and you should do some kind of annual dose calculation. In the U.S., it's required by law. So we have to do this annually. Every one of our systems, we have to calculate it. And as we talk about in the next sec, in the next talk, all of our dose calculations have to be below a, a certain value. If there's a threshold. And if the system is above that threshold, you cannot use the machine. And so I, I don't know to what extent Thailand has adopted similar uh, standards. I know the IAEA basically has the same recommendations. So I assume Thailand's probably following the IAEA. Mm -hmm. And then what you do is you can go in and you look at the values and that 18% will tell you where you, how you can adjust your outputs. So if you are making your measurements and you are you know, right at the threshold or maybe a little bit above, you need to dial that down because of that 18% that threshold can go both ways. If you're below that value, but you're barely, barely close to it, you know, say this is the threshold and you're just really right below. Remember that plus 18 can actually actually push you a little higher. So you may still ask yourself, can I go a little lower? But once again, everything is always based on looking at the image quality. We've talked about it from the very beginning that just simply turning down the dose is actually not an appropriate thing to do in radiology. The radiologists need to be able to make their diagnosis. And mammography, as we talked about last week, is particularly difficult. <laughs> it's, well, we're going to talk about dose optimization next. We're going to talk about all the tools and tricks we have to make the image better, excuse me, the dose better, based on all the image stuff we talked about last week. <laughs> So maybe the, the questions that we have here, you can answer after the next call. So the question is about the, right now we have the AEC system. So how can we reduce the dose level for our protocol? Do you have like a density level set? Uh yeah. Um, so why don't, I mean, so the answer is there's a couple of things we can do. What, let's talk okay. about that in a minute because I have a whole lecture on this. 